Good evening, everyone. My name is Bridget Black. I'm the Vice President of the New York Book Forum, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to our event titled The Debut Author and Modern Marketing. We're incredibly excited to introduce our moderator for tonight, Nicholas Latimer, who is a fellow Vice President and Senior Director of Publicity at Knopf. As for our panel this evening, we have Laura Keefe, who is the Senior Marketing Director for Alfred A. Knopf, and Nick Fuller Guggens, author of The Great Transition, and a member of both the Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance and the National Education Association. Nick and I also happen to be in the same book club at the Banded Brewing Company in Biddeford, Maine, which is how we met. Without further ado, please take it away, Nicholas. Here we are. We're um, going to be talking about um, marketing and publicity for debut writers. Now, um, I think uh, Laura and I have both worked with debut writers and worked on debut books before. Um, and Nick, you actually have a book coming out, mm -hmm. um, coming up in like sometime in the fall. Uh, August, August. 15th. August. Okay. Uh, so um, that sort of leads me into, um, well, first of all, what's the name of it? The Great Transition. The Great coming Transition. Out through, um, with Atria, an imprint of Simon & Schuster. Very interesting. So, um, do you have do you have a like a two minute elevator pitch? Yeah, yeah, no, I do. It's a it's a, it's a climate crisis utopia set in the near future, um, and we have a fifteen year old Emmy Vargas has grown up in kind of a utopian city after uh, humanity's rallied and saved the world, um, but everything changes when uh, there's a, an underground movement to assassinate living climate criminals and her mother mysteriously disappears during this and she may be involved she might not be her and her dad go look for her and they're not the only ones looking for her dun, dun, dun. Uh -huh. mm. <laughs> and who's who who is the audience for this is it an adult? Is it yes. young adult? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it was interesting. Once I started talking with the publicist and marketer, um, it was the first time they had mentioned that there could be a good a room for some YA crossover. Um, they brought up the fact that a lot of YA readers now are in their 20s and 30s, like people who grow up reading The Hunger Games. Um, and so, yeah, and the, the main character is 15. So, but originally intended for an adult audience. Um, but yeah, they brought up, I thought it was a good point. Could be, could be both. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Yeah. Okay. So Laura, maybe you and I should sort of have a little, um, um, just sort of like a basic, um, sort of questions about, um, when the process should start for helping a debut writer. Um, and I feel like, and then, Mark will chime in and say, "Hey, did you hit that milestone yet?" I mean, Nick. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll go from there. So, like in general, sort of, Laura, what do you think about the timing for when is when should when should one start talking about to the outside world? Um, so you know, I tend to think of the magic time frame as nine months, but prior to a publication date, um, and that sort of works mainly driven by when a book feeds out to retailers. Um, so a, a book information, metadata, title can't actually, won't be ingested or sold by a, an Amazon or a Barnes and Noble or another book retailer. And so you can't really start collecting pre-orders prior to that moment. And so we tend to sort of back all of our marketing support for a book out um, to that nine month point. So then all of our activity can really start generating pre-orders for a book. And it still gives you a nice long runway for building awareness and getting early reads and starting to reach out to influencers. Um, you know, but I think frequently also um, a, an author, a new author may not even be introduced to their full marketing and publicity team until maybe six months pre-pub. But just because an introduction hasn't happened doesn't mean the work isn't happening. Uh, so mm -hmm. a team is frequently working on a book and getting word out, even if they haven't had a full round of introductions to an author. Um, so that's the marketing side. What about publicity? Well, publicity, you know, it's funny. Um, I think by and large, people don't like to find out about it that soon. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm more of a legacy publicity person. I deal with um, newspapers, magazines, and people before they had online. 
um, they had deadlines for printing and and really you wanted like three and four weeks, three or four months sort of in advance. And for the pre-reviewers, sort of, you know, like the sooner the better, but really you didn't need to go more than five months in advance. Um, and I think that's still sort of true for most people. And in general, I think that, um, you know, sending something out too far in advance, I think people tend to sort of forget. So <laughs> in some ways, I sort of I sort of like not going out too far in advance. But then again, um, for some really long lead time places that, you know, there has an opportunity for being a big feature, like in Vogue or Vanity Fair or something like that. Going out farther is not a bad idea. And plus, it sort of plants the idea of doing maybe a serial or something like that. Granted, debut writers very rarely get serials, but if there's like, you, you got paid a lot of money and it was a big announced um, publication that there was an auction for, going out early is probably not a bad idea. Um, but I think closer to the date is probably better. Um, now, going out, what do you think you need to go out with? Do you need to have a completed manuscript? Do you need to have a jacket? Do you need to have all that sort of stuff? To start marketing a book? To start, yeah. Like, yeah. and how, or, I mean, do you really, I mean, you and I work in a place where um, they fine tune the jackets and are really do not like to show jackets before they're ready. But the retailers want to see them before, as soon as possible. So we're always got that tug of war. Um, Nick, I'm assuming your jacket's done. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting hearing you all talk about that because when my so my book sold in um geez now it would have been February of twenty twenty two. Meaning the Salesforce sold it to uh that that sorry, Atria um, acquired her, it. Yeah. Acquired oh, I it. see. Oh, I see. And I remember wanting, I think I reached out to the editor right away saying, like, oh, I have all these ideas for marketing and publicity. Like when when can I meet the team? And he was kind of like, okay, uh, patience, patience. And I think the six month mark, almost exactly six months before the book is going to be for sale was when the first time we all met virtually. But like you all were saying, they'd been doing a lot of work before that. So I think the book cover and everything had been ready in December. And then they were kind of populating um, you know, the Amazon and Barnes and Noble pages and doing all that, all that groundwork. Um, but yeah, the six month mark was, was, was pretty, was a big deal in terms of like bringing me on board and filling me in on the process and getting me involved. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Interesting. And so Laura, what about jackets in general? Can you, can you, can you actually be, have an effective sort of marketing campaign to start something without a jacket? Uh, I, you know, I think the jacket is a book cover, a jacket, as we say, is the most important marketing tool that we have for a book, hands down. Um, you know, it, there's that old chestnut about it. You can't judge a book by its cover, but you can't get anybody interested in a book that they're just looking at the title of, unfortunately. I think you need to offer them the whole package and kind of show them what it is that they're looking for in a book. Uh, and is give them something visual to hold on to, I think, especially given that so much of our digital marketing now is visual based on various social media platforms, we have to have something to show. So um, for my money, a cover is the most important thing that I can have, followed by some really catchy copy. Um, a full manuscript for people to be able to read is also great. Uh, not a necessity on like the really far out end of the spectrum, but Ultimately, we're going to want to start building a lot of consumer and bookseller and other, you know, sort of influencer buzz. And we need to offer somebody, people something to read so we can come out with a package and a strong pitch and then follow up with a manuscript if we need to. But um, definitely need that cover as far out as we can get it. Interesting. And does, like, who are the best outlets? I mean, when you send it out, um, you know, do different publishers have... They, oh, you, you all have like your Instagram and I mean, what are the, just rattle off the places that you send it to. Um, so, uh, you know, I think in terms of if we're talking about a cover reveal, um, as we call it, uh, 
you can some people you can sometimes go down the route of doing a media cover a media partnership cover of where will you go to like an entertainment weekly or a people magazine and partner up so that they can be the first ones to show a book's cover um if i'm being honest we're seeing kind of very minimal impact from those these days in terms of actual sales generation so frequently Frequently, we like to just lead with it on either our own social platforms. So in my case, that would be Knopf's or if the author has a great social platform, uh, it, it often makes sense for them to be the first people to show the cover to the world and have that kind of first moment of excitement and opportunity to collect requests and put, had, add to people's to read shelves on Goodreads and drive pre-sales. So Nick, are you on social media? Yes. And were you before or or did you start because kind of, of half, I was half on I was on um, I was on writer Twitter, which is, I guess, what I've learned kind of like the one nice, uh, I feel like friendly part of Twitter. Um, and so just interacting with other writers. But then with Atria has a wonderful social media coordinator and kind of gave me a one on one tutorial and really encouraged me to get onto Instagram as well. And that's been um, which I'd always been a little hesitant for personally, but it's been really helpful for the book. So Achia has their own, they send out advanced copies to people on TikTok and Instagram. And then there's electronic the, copies. Yeah. Uh, well, no, actually, digital copies. no physical, because a lot of the Instagram uh, will come through with these like, you know, these beautiful photographs with a like, coffee mug and flowers and just like gorgeously rendered <laughs> Laura's smiling. She loves when that happens. Yeah, it's so pretty. And so then it's this really cool feedback loop because then I will, you know, always thank anybody who's gonna like take time to post or talk about my talk about the great transition. And then sometimes they'll they'll then reach back to me and we've set up some interviews um, over Instagram Live come like for when the book comes out. Um, so it's been an interesting kind of like where I'll, I'll get involved on my end, but it's all through the back of you know the company sending out books to everybody to their they must have lists of of people that you know they, that they regularly connect to um but it's worked really well so i'm glad i kind of was like dragged onto it kicking and screaming but i'm really glad that they convinced me to <laughs> that's good i think probably you should make a testimonial because laura do you run into that a lot um so you know i i like to say with social media in general, especially where authors are concerned, you know, it, it is a nice to have, but if you're really anti a specific platform or anti social media in general, uh, you're probably not going to be all that good at it. And so Nick, it sounds like oh, you're kind of a best case scenario where you were convinced to do it, but you're now really engaging with it and you're connecting with readers and with people who are in the book world and you're doing everything you're supposed to do, um, which is great. Okay. So what I always tell authors is sort of like, think about the various social platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, does one of them appeal to you more than the other? Go ahead and do that one that you like the most. Don't pressure yourself to do every single thing. Just do the one that you're going to be the best at and connect with your audience in the most authentic way on. So, you know, Nick, I'll follow you on Instagram, but it sounds like you're, you know, you're doing the thing that your team told you the same thing I would tell my authors. Yeah, yeah. No, they gave really great instructions. And I think, you know, they're like, if this is in the best interest of the novel, you know, they're like clearly know what they're doing and I'm ready to take that instruction. And it's been, it really has been great. Like you say, I have connected with a lot of readers and it's been really sweet to see that, like that early influencing. And how soon did you start doing that? I think this uh, January, uh, January, February, I got mm -hmm. on, uh, set up an account and uh, yeah, I've just been just, just trying my best, but. <laughs> very good, very good. So, Laura, what if, you know, you really did have someone who was, didn't really want to do social media um, and you had to talk them into it and then it took forever and then forever and forever and forever. How late can you start something with, with like social media? Is it, is it, is it ever too late to start? I guess is what I'm wondering. It's never too late to start. It does take time to build up a platform and to make those connections. Uh, it's also a time commitment. I mean, I'm sure Nick spends time every day going on there and finding yeah. ways to engage with people. And so, you know, I think 
if you're reluctant to take on the time commitment, um, that's something to consider. Uh, the other thing is that all, publishers all have their own platforms now and they are robust. And so if you are a debut author who does not have a social presence and feels very strongly that it's not for you, that is the reason your publisher has a social platform and they will go out there and do the promotion for your book. Um, but you know, it takes a lot of time to grow a social platform. And I think ideally, you start sooner rather than later, um, but it's never too late. Maybe people are out there waiting for you to join. Maybe you're Cormac McCarthy. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. Um, well, um, you know, it's funny because you have, Nick, you, you have a novel. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Laura, what do you think about the um, someone who's actually going to be a debut writer who is a nonfiction, writing a memoir or something like that. Um, are there any different challenges to doing something like that? Or is it still sort of probably the same? A lot of it is the same. Uh, you know, a, a memoir in particular, I think, has a readership that uh, is very specific. A lot of people just know they love to read memoir. And a lot of people who are book influencers or reviewers or, you know, in that sphere know that they like to read memoir. Uh, I think if there's a nonfiction book, there are always ways to connect with people who are relevant to the subject of your nonfiction book, whether it's history or you're writing a book about the military or, you know, um, nature. Like, you know, I think there are plenty of different audiences where people can find their platforms. I would tend to recommend maybe looking at Twitter for a nonfiction writer where there's a lot more media engagement uh, and it's a lot more top you know, conversation tends to be more topical. Uh, fiction and memoir are very at home on Instagram and TikTok. Um, Facebook can be a little bit of everything. Uh, so I think you could ask your social media teams for advice if you were wondering about the best platform for your particular type of book that your, is your debut. And how often do you like, um, actually, this is probably for both of you. How often do you need to engage with this? I mean, do you um, with your, can you do it every day? Well, once a week do it. Um, and, uh, you know, if you sort of fall off or can you like post something and then go away for a while? Um, I mean, Nick, are you, do you, what's your, what's your routine? Do you get up and do have uh, coffee and do it every day? Like, it's so I was, I was told once a week would be a really good kind of like minimum everything everything was kind of like to feed the algorithm what the algorithm wants will, will but i have been i mean right these are made to be very addictive um and so i'm definitely on it every day and it's both which i think a lot of people both in this industry not interact with social media in a way that's both fun and kind of exasperating so i'm probably spending more time on it now than i wish i was but, in my, but I know it's like, all right, for the, for the good of the book, and it is fun. It is fun interacting and connecting with readers. Um, but yes, definitely every day. Um, I teach elementary school, so there's like six hours a day. I definitely cannot be um, on my phone. I just have zero time. Um, but before and after, yeah, a lot. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I think the algorithm is the is the key. You know, you're you're rewarded by the algorithm on these various platforms for doing more and engaging more. Engagement is kind of the magical number we're always looking at. Um, and so don't post something and go away for a month. I think once a week is a great minimum, but ideally maybe it's more than that if you can find time to make the content and you know get in your comments and have conversations with people. Um, uh, Laura, this is a question for you, but then also Nick, it's a question for you in a different way. Um, how does one go about producing a trailer and are they effective? Do they sell? I mean, are they, do they sort of help engagement? Um, you know, we produce trailers. Uh, we have a creative team in-house where we can do it. There are also plenty of places, uh, you know, people you can hire to produce a book trailer for you too. I think they're a nice to have. They're not a need to have. Um, they can be fun to set up the book and provide some content on your social channels. But again, I rarely see one-to-one -one sales or pre-order results based on a trailer rolling out. Um, what I'm doing more of now is creating tiny little short 
video clips and content that we can use for advertising on various platforms and YouTube. I find that to be a more effective use of, you know, both budget and time as far as marketing team goes uh, to rather than a book trailer properly. Uh -huh. mm. Laura, I don't know um, if this is what you, if this is what you're talking about as, as far as small clips, but I just this past weekend came to New York to visit my brother. Um, I live in Maine. And so while I was there, I went by the Atria headquarters and they had a film kind of studio. And so they asked me, we had to fund, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes. So they asked me a bunch of questions about the book and I did, a little, I read a little bit and I think they're going to use it for similar purposes. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. I think like, you know, the way people engage with content on almost all social platforms now is in these tiny little snippets yeah. rather than a full mm -hmm. two minute produced trailer. Um, right. And often, you know, I think people want to see the authors and hear what the authors have to say about their writing and their research and their book. And so those short sort of more personal things tend to be more effective, especially in a place like Instagram. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, have um, ha over the last two or three years and during COVID have um, has social media changed in the way they um, sort of approach books in general? I think like, for instance, when did book talk sort of become a thing? Book talk is the big one. Uh, it is the big late. one, but when did it, like, when did it, I mean, there was TikTok, obviously. I think it, it, TikTok itself sort of really started to have its major growth period during the pandemic when everybody was stuck at home and discovering the joys of TikTok. Um, and book talk, and, uh, I, I think, you know, the effects of book talk when they organically get behind a book. Colleen Hoover being one of the more famous examples or a book or an author can just really drive books into the stratosphere. Um, you know, A Little Life, the Hanya Yanagohara was one that was an early book talk sensation. Uh, and that was probably two years ago, 2021-ish was when we started to see the effects. And I think, you know, I heard recently uh, that they're, they, they're kind of seeing a plateau on the book talk effect in terms of the sales. It's not declining. Um, but I think the as I mentioned earlier, the super important thing for authors to keep in mind is that TikTok is very organically driven, meaning um, the content that works there works because it's gotten into their algorithm and people have engaged with it and they've loved it, but it's not something you can manipulate or fake. And so, uh, you know, you can't just say, how do we make this go viral on TikTok? Uh, unfortunately, you know, we all want that to happen and we're trying to make it happen, but it's, uh, it's definitely something that's sort of at the whim of the, of the algorithm and the audience a little bit. What do you think? I mean, I have to say, I'm not a book talker. Um, what's been like the most effective kind of, um, would you say? Books that make you cry. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> uh, I think I've, we've seen the success that we've seen, you know, in my group at Knopf are um, books that really elicit a strong emotional reaction, uh, plus, you know, books that are sexy or uh, scary, you know, there's a whole horror talk subgenre. Um, but I think, you know, you see the, you know, our book Crying in H Mart has been particularly successful on book talk um, because it is just emotionally devastating and people love to talk about how it made them feel when they read it. Which was her debut book also, <laughs> which is interesting. So um, it's nice to know, you know, I'm old enough to remember, um, have been here long enough to remember when um, 50 Shades of Grey came out, you know, before all of this was going on and how that became such a huge sensation, enormous sensation and just changed the way that we published a lot of books, primarily paperback um, at the time. And it's, and it, and I just, you know, um, Colleen Hoover is a good example because she was self-published, yes? Before, wasn't she self-published? I mean, a long time ago, first, but she had long time many ago? books with a publisher prior when book talk was uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So do these things, um, do you happen to know, Laura, um, are people who are self-published, are there, I, I know I see them, um, I, I know for a fact that some of them sell quite well. Um, I would say most of them probably don't, but I'm assuming social media is like a big part of that because um, they don't really have the, the, uh, uh, the big publisher backing them. 
Yeah, I mean, there have been some incredible self-publishing sensations, and I think a lot of self-published authors work really hard to promote their own books, and they engage with fans on social, and they work really hard to build up a, build up a following, and they, um, you know, work within the ecosystems that they're in. Uh, and so I think that's where you'll see a lot of that success. Um, it, it is, it's tough because you don't have a built-in publisher marketing and sales machine backing you if you're a self-published author, but um, there are definitely paths to pretty phenomenal success there. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask something that's sort of um, at least in-house is um, something that I, I take a particular interest in, and that is having the right author photo for your um, thing. So... Nick, I'm assuming you have your author photo all taken care of. Yeah, I do. It's funny, though, because it's from the before times, before the pandemic. Uh -huh. um, when I had short hair, I stopped. It's a, a long story, but stopped growing my hair um, in the, during the pandemic. is kind of like a game I was playing with my students. We had a basketball net in our classroom, and if they made enough shots, I was going to go home and cut my hair. And it's been three years now, basically, that no grades can do it anyway um i do have an author photo taken probably in but 2019 i think okay. um, and yeah i like it enough that i didn't want to go through the process again well i'm always encouraging our writers to actually have a recent photo um <laughs> i'm on the i'm on the receiving end of um of all the publications that say hey can you send us a photo or can you um and if it's someone who's been around for a while, um, they go, oh, don't you have a more recent photo? But then again, a debut writer, no one knows what that person looks like. Hey, nobody knows. No one nobody knows. knows. So you're just starting off fresh. Yeah. So, but the next time you might need to get a new photo. Or a hair um, Yeah, you might need to. It is color, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm a big believer in that. Um, Laura, is it important for people to see what authors look like? Yeah, I think. I mean, because um, you said jackets were more important, um, were the most important, which I are. think is true. Yeah. Um, but do people really care what people look like, or 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 do you find that there are some authors who go, sort of go, I do not want people to know what I look like. Um, rarely. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I think most most authors are, you know, under or under understand that we put the photo in the back of the book on the flap and we put it on the Amazon page. I think, you know, just a note to you debut authors out there, you're always going to want to claim your Amazon page and your Goodreads account. Um, you Public service announcement. Thank yeah, you for that. For yourself uh, and all those things they ask for photos to come with too. I, I have seen authors go down the route of using a, you know, emoji or other item, you know, sort of more digital that if they're not comfortable having an actual photo taken um and that's fine as well but i think you know they are a, a piece of what we do usually okay so so nick are you pretty much do you feel like um as far as uh you you seem to be having a good relationship with your your publisher um have you had any roadblocks that you know people need to know about like um someone not getting back to you or did you think you know, yeah, no, I think the big the big lesson, like if I could talk to myself back when the book first was acquired, um, I, I just like as I mentioned, felt like really anxious to talk to um, the the pub the publicity and marketing people. I, I guess I had like heard this, I don't know, not a myth isn't the right word, but just this idea of like, oh, they're, yeah, they're never gonna get back to you. It's gonna be you're on your own and as my editor is saying, like, just, you know, when six months comes around, we're all going to meet. And they've been amazing since. Like, just this morning, I came across an independent newspaper in Portland, Maine, that I thought could be a good fit. And I sent an email to the publicist. And, right, you know, she, within the day, she said, oh, all right, I'm going to pitch them. That's a great idea. They've been so communicative, such a great, such a good team. And I think... Um, also, Simon Schuster has this program called Top Shelf. So every season, so four times a year, the whole marketing and sales team uh, kind of like book clubs, a bunch of selections coming out and then votes internally on one that they're really excited about and want to really get behind. And so that they chose the great transition to very extremely fortunate. Um, and so maybe I'm getting some 
are probably getting a little extra attention, but I think they're just an amazing team and have been doing an awesome job and are just so communicative. Uh, I feel like really, really well taken care of for sure. That's great. Yeah. Um, and when you met with them, did you meet them in person or was it like this? Was it Zoom? Yeah, it was like this, but we did, when I went down to New York last weekend, we met, we met in person and got to meet a lot of the sales team, kind of people behind the scenes who are working so hard and just felt, you know, I feel like I've always known right at the end of a movie, the credits roll and you realize how many people are involved. I'm glad you said that. And it's like, I've been astounded and emotional of how many people are working so hard um, for all of these books. It's really, it's really heartwarming. And so it's nice to be able to thank people in person. I think there are a lot of people in the audience who are probably grateful that an author has just said that. Oh, <laughs> there are a lot of people I mean, behind. Yeah, it's been who, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Work on that acknowledgements page. Yeah, right. <laughs> and they've also been really open to, um, I've, I've really appreciated that I've had some other ideas about um, publicity and marketing that they've been really open to. So like in the book, the main character, Emmy, loves oldies music, which is now, you know, for her, this is like, Beyonce and Britney uh, and Bruno Mars. And so the marketing team is working on putting together playlists that will go out as part of a reader's guide, I think, and um, some ideas for artwork. So, so they've just been really open. Um, and I guess I would also, I don't know, I guess I, I'm not sure if this is again, a situation that applies for all debut authors, but I would just encourage like reaching out to the marketing and publicity people if you have ideas. Um, not all of my ideas have been great, I know. Like I totally acknowledge that you all are the professionals. Um, but yeah, I've just had some other thoughts and I feel like they've been open and receptive to them. So I, it really feels like we're a team in that sense. That's great. Yeah. And um, how did, did, back us up a little bit and tell us how, um, the, your agent experience was did you I'm assuming you had an agent yeah how did you find your agent very 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 circuitous route um that I mean I should try to let me try to summarize this really quickly <laughs> but um so all right a short story that had appeared in an uh, uh in a literary magazine and an editor from another imprint from crown reached out to me years ago um, and eventually sent him some pages of this, of the great transition, but I didn't have an agent. My agent had left the industry. Um, and he was really excited about the pages, but his imprint had been, I think had folded and he was no longer acquiring fiction. He recommended me to another editor, um, who gave me, loved the book, gave me a list of, uh, agents to reach out to one of whom is now my wonderful um, agent Danielle Bukowski at Sterling Lord. And uh, so that was like kind of, that was the happy story, but it was really circuitous. Boy, you were lucky. Yeah. 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 Good for you. Good for you. And is, was your agent involved when in those meetings in, in New York or um, I mean, assuming yes, but not necessarily. So not in person. Cause at that point we had all met, but she has been, she, yes, she, so she had been involved in yeah, every, every meeting, um, she was there, uh, also felt really well taken care of um, by her as well. Because for me, you know, I've been writing like 10 years um, before this book came out and feel like I know the craft of fiction really well at this point. Um, I know about writing. And then since the book was acquired, this has been like, I'm like a baby, like learning everything for the first time. Everything is new. And it's really, it, it does feel really overwhelming at times. So the idea of suddenly, if I had been in a meeting, you know, with the editor and publicist and a marketer and the social media person um, without my agent would have been, yeah, it would have been, I would have been nervous and, you know, a little uncomfortable. So she, she's been wonderful. Good. You're going to, you're going to love them. You're not going to need it anymore. You're, you're, you don't need it. It's fine. You'll be fine. Yeah. So Laura, question. You and I both deal, well, I probably deal with it more than you do, but what if you get a really bad response to something? 
like I get a bad review, I can deal with it, you know, but what is, are there people who just go out and just are bad about, and just say nasty things about books? Or do you find it's, it's really, most people post only positive things? I mean, I think, listen, the, the negative people are out there. This is the world that we live in. Um, you know, I think the, the bigger- I'm trying to get you ready for that, Nick, just in case someone hates it. <laughs> the bigger a book is, the louder the negativity can be too, you know? But, um, you know, what I, I think for the most part, it's a very positive industry. You know, most people are out there trying to build people up, not take them down. I think, especially if you're talking about book influencers on Instagram or TikTok, um, especially for debuts. I think people aren't really out to tank a debut. Um, I think the other thing though, I tell my authors is like, if you can help it, don't read the Goodreads reviews. Don't read the Amazon reviews. If you can keep yourself away from that feedback, that sort of consumer feedback, you know, it's out of your control and you might feel very frustrated by the takes that some of these readers have on your books. Um, but ultimately there's not much you can do about it. And, you know, it's my hope as a marketer that the positive reviews and ratings and posts always outweigh the negative. Um, but I think, you know, I can understand how it it's hurtful and frustrating to have something you've worked really long and hard on get bad feedback online, but, you know, by and large, I don't think people are getting like attacked out there in the world, really. Do you think, um, uh, Laura, this is more for you, like when when Nick went in and met his team, um, is there like a checklist you sort of give writers when they come in and say, boy, it would be great to have this and this and this from you? Um, like, j just like any debut writer should just know, expect this. Like, I'm gonna always ask them for an author questionnaire. Nick, I'm assuming you filled out your author questionnaire because <laughs> those are really great for us because they tell you, you know, not only, you know, citizenship and all those things that we need for awards, but also, you know, publications you might know or have worked for or do something like that. So, Laura, are there any other checklist things that um, just in general you recommend debut writers sort of have ready? Love, love to give my authors homework. <laughs> um, you know, I think we talked a lot about social, so I think we're covered there. Um, but we're also always encouraging authors, you know, as soon as we've acquired a book to start thinking about all of the people who they've connected with uh, over their life, be they other writers or potential reviewers or even just friends who they might want to be in touch with the book about. Um, you know, blurbing is always a big conversation in terms of going out and getting blurbs from other writers to promote books early on before we have reviews in. Um, I like to encourage my authors to go and introduce themselves to the booksellers and the owners at their local independent bookstores, just to try to start making some of those connections out in the world. Um, like Nick said, you know, we work very collaboratively. And so if people come and have thought about ideas or audiences or sort of fun and clever ways to promote their books, we always love to hear about those. I mean, I think Nick, I, I'm, haven't been a publicist for a very long time, but um, a big conversation is always like what kind of other pieces and essays could mm -hmm. actually yeah. be writing in relation to your book and can those be pitched to media outlets uh, as sort of a roundabout way of getting some additional book promotion that is not a review uh, for the book in, in print or digital. Um, you know, I think the other thing um, I, I tell people if they're wondering if they should build their own website, uh, I always encourage them to do that. I think an author, particularly a debut author, needs to think about owning their own brand. And what you don't want to do as an author is hand a lot of that to a publisher because you are your brand and you own your website and you update it and you make sure it's exactly what you want it to be. Uh, publishers are always happy to provide guidance, but you know, there's no guarantee you're going to have the same books with the same publisher for the whole rest of your career. And so it's important that you sort of are maintaining ownership of all of those platforms yourself. Um, so I always, you know, I'm happy to help out with that kind of thing, but I always encourage authors to pursue all of that on their own. Um, and then, you know, we're always happy to just have conversations and bounce ideas off of each other and no, especially for debuts who haven't done this before, like no question is too small or too strange, you know, with it, it's a strange industry. So we're always happy to provide guidance on it where we can. Um, Nick, are you friends with, do you have like a lot, a lot of other writer friends? 
I always think, and, and Laura, maybe this is a question that you can weigh in on too. Uh, I mean, you had mentioned blurbs and I think, you know, it's always nice when people in the, out in the, in the world at large are sort of talking about books and, you know, even if it's just to a small audience, I think it's just helpful um, to, to, to actually have people who are commenting. So um, do you, is, is that a good thing to do? Is, should someone go out and, and, and what about comparisons? Like, oh, this author is, writes the sort of thing that I want to do. Don't you want to sort of become part of that group? Hmm. You know, I will say for other other debut authors that I like, I have a lot of writer friends that are starting out like me. So when it came time to come up with a list of people to ask for blurbs, like I didn't, I didn't really have much to bring to the table. But the editor and my agent um, really were amazing at reaching at, at thinking of um, authors that made a lot of sense, like the because this is like a this is a climate book. So they reached out to a lot of other authors who've been writing kind of other hopeful climate books. And, and, and that has built a little hopeful climate book community. And anyway, just to take the pressure off of, of other authors, it's not totally up to you um, to come up to, to happen to have some connections from your earlier life. Like I really didn't have, uh, I didn't, I didn't have too much. And so you, your all. publisher didn't instruct you since you're up in Maine to like drive over to Stephen King's house and give him a manuscript i mean could may, you know maybe that'll be in the cards we'll see it, <laughs> this is a surprisingly big state he lives way far up north but he I, lives way up north but he's he incredibly could, generous to, to new that. writers that would be amazing yeah. yeah um but yeah no but the editor um the editor and agent were really really helpful with that and i'm laura don't you think it's probably a good idea for writers to all support each other i mean they're uh, they're all in the same boat as it were and um by and large don't they sort of like to all do things together yeah there's definitely a big writerly community out there and it's great i mean i think there's also um you know it's always nice to connect with people who who understand where you're coming from in terms of experience the experience of publishing a book and writing a book um that's something that uh, you know is not shared by a huge number of people, and so it's nice to connect with a community in that way as well. Um, you know, the other thing too is that if you end up doing events when you are published and uh, you need people to do sort of conversation with you at various events, uh, you it's nice to have sort of a community of writers you can approach and say, "Hey, I have an event at this bookstore. Would you mind coming and being in conversation with me?" And that way we can sort of have double the draw for potential attendees. Yeah, actually, that's a I'm nice. Gonna, yeah, I'm gonna go turn ahead. it around on you. I feel like we need to have some publicity advice for okay. for our new authors. Okay. Well, <laughs> I was I was sort of like building up to um, what uh, what can be done sort of before you get to publication, um, building up to it. So you're right. As when it comes time for for publicity and um, that sort of kicks off. Those are the times that you um, did you meet your publicist as well, or did you just meet the the, the social media people? Um, no, I met everyone. Yeah, so you met everyone. You media, met the team, publicist and marketer and the editor. So it's kind of all the four of them. Yeah, great, 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 great. Well, um, you know, it's it's funny. I like to think that um, it's most effective for um, uh, you'll see uh, more interest from. The publicist who want to work with you starting like three months before your book comes out because that's when people start to really plan and um and send books out for review and see if they're going to get assigned because you know not only does it have to get to the critic it has to get to the to the editor who's actually going to find a place for that to live um and that 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 doesn't happen as far out in advance as it used to, believe it or not. I think people want to know about it, but I don't think it actually happens. Um, it, and it's sort of alarming because we used to, um, I would say without fail, um, that the when we sent out bound galleys, that determined the fate of a book. When you actually got a physical galley and you sent it to someone, because most of the people who were actually reviewing were reviewing from that book. 
I happen to know now that, for instance, like some of the daily critics for the New York Times, they don't even look at galleys. They wait until the finished book. And I think that's sort of surprising that they wait until that late. I think they pretty much say, I'm going to plan on reviewing this, but they don't actually have, they haven't actually read it, um, which um, still boggles my mind that someone who is like one of the daily critics can sort of plan that far in advance, but that's sort of what they do. That's their job. You know, it's like one of the sort of things you go, I'm just going to sit around and read all day, but then you have to sit and write it. Right. And, um, and you just hope you sort of grab them on a good day. But by and large, the publicity effort, um, starting at three months in advance, you start to get a sense of um, who's going to do it and who's not going to do it. Um, and if you find out that someone's probably not going, is, has a little interest in it, then that's the time you start sort of working on them and saying, don't you think you can do a little bit or can't we find time to do this? Or um, if it's a debut writer, I think lots of times there are those things that are going to be groups. Even the New York Times has, you know, in the back, they do briefly noted and the New York Times, the New Yorker, all those sort of things happen. And, and they, and they tend to happen about that time. And um, it is um, both heartening to know that those sort of things still happen, but it's also, there are fewer and fewer places that actually have real estate to run actual reviews these days. Um, and so, and every place that used to have, uh, were just strictly print, now everyone is print and online. And some of them do um, a remarkable job. Um, but like, for instance, the New York Times, they will run something online. And it, then you think, wow, that's really great that it's there. And then you twiddle your thumbs waiting for the print version to come. And then it doesn't actually come um, for a couple of weeks. And I think that's the way the world has shifted in a good way. And, and and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I do think they're undermining what's going to happen to the print. I mean, I'm a legacy person. I really, um, I like getting the physical paper and like it, like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. I, I really do. And I'm going to be um, sorry when I when those things start to um, disappear. Hopefully they won't for a while, but I think it's probably inevitable. Um, but, um, you know, that's sort of happened, but you know, in there are also places that won't be reviewing your book, but they'll want to talk to you about your book. That's another great thing that um, that debut writers benefit from. People want to know how how someone created that world, and it's wonderful. And sometimes it's in the you know, it's a Q and A that you do and that someone sends you and they send it back. And sometimes it's actually an interview where you sit down with someone and then ends up online somewhere or, or in print. And those things are really wonderful. So, you know, I think by and large fiction and especially literary fiction is, um, is a harder and harder sell to most places to get coverage. But I think people hunger for that sort of thing. And like, you know, Thank God for places like the New York Review of Books and, um, you know, and place and the New York, there are a whole bunch of places that still run place, run reviews and, um, and getting the material in advance is a part of that. And three months out is, I would say, the, the last part that you can do. And that's, uh, you know, Nicholas, if you're lining up um, things like interviews or podcasts or you know digital coverage like that tends to come in a lot closer to pub now as well right like yeah it's, you know it used to be that five or ten years ago you'd have all these things sort of booked out early but now it's a lot of things kind of slotting in much closer to a publication date right very late and some people wait until they see a finished book before mm -hmm. they commit to doing and, something. And just FYI to new writers, we tend to have our finished books um, like six, four to six weeks before the book uh, yeah. is uh, books on sale date. So yeah. prior to that, we're working with either print or digital galleys. Hard to believe, but it's true. So, um, so 
Nick, what are you expecting on like day one? Are you going to be are you going to be heartbroken if you don't um, like have a review that that you don't have a review scheduled in the New York Times or um, I'm assuming the New York Times. I mean, the I, main papers will probably cover you. The main I've paper. Been, um, I guess just like I think a lot of writers uh, have, you know, amassed years and years of rejection. Um, leading up to anything successful so at every step along this I've just had I've been trying to keep the most realistic lowest expectations while I'll be also being really grateful so um, I, no I'm not I mean I'm not expecting I know I know how tough it is like you're saying um, I used to work in journalism and uh, you know public writing essays like I know as you're saying there's less less real estate so I, I yeah, I think I have realistic expectations for it. I also know like this publicity and marketing team is working really hard, but so much is, right? Isn't this true? Like there's so much is just also like luck and you never know what's going to happen. I had some writer friends who had books gonna, books coming out like during the, was it the 2016 or 2020, in 2020, like right during the presidential elections. Was oh really boy, loud. yeah. And then... um. Oh, and then like my heart broke for people who had books coming out in March of 2020. So I don't know, you know, I know it's like, we've put in a lot of hard work, but luck also plays a big, a big role in it. So I'm setting realistic expectations. <laughs> it's been a fun ride, no matter what happens. <laughs> well, you know, people, you're, everyone you're working with at your publisher will be grateful that you have that. Um, um, outlook about it. Um, and I think that hopefully a year after, you know, when this is <clears throat> all said and done, you'll sit, you'll look back on this and, <clears throat> excuse me, and say, I had a great publication. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Exactly. That, that's the dream. Do, yeah. um, I was wondering, Nicholas, if do you, do you, for your authors, do you also, in addition to reviews, pitch, um, like Laura was mentioning, like op-eds tangentially related to the novel and things like that? We always do, yes. Do you, we have a great- find there's still it. like more of an appetite for those, that type of engagement versus a traditional review? You know, I think that um, that's a very good conversation to have and it depends on what you've written about. Um, I would think that um, we had a couple of, we had a writer who was a novelist and she was Haitian. And when um, she, uh, and she, she's a very uh, she's a beloved writer, and we thought it would be great to get her to write her perspective when the you know when when tragedy hit ha um, Haiti, mm -hmm. and um, and she sort of had to be persuaded to want to do that because she said I'm a novelist and I sort of um, um, would feel uncomfortable doing that, but then she finally, she, she wrote something and she felt comfortable with it and we were able to do that. So it's harder to get a novelist to do that, but it depends on what they've written. Mm, okay. I mean, I would, I guess there's just other advice I would have for first time authors in my position is that I got encouragement in similar ways from the publicity team and it's been a lot of fun and it's really helped me kind of like explore you know, there's questions I've been asked now in from readers, like a lot about theme and things that like writers don't really set out thinking about um, when you're when you're launching a book. And, you know, it's it's more about, you know, sentence to sentence or the characters. And so the questions from readers have been a lot different. And this really helped me kind of synthesize and think about um, what readers are contemplating by writing shorter, you know, one 1500 thousand word op eds like for my book related to climate justice and the climate crisis and climate criminals. And I used to work installing solar panels. So I've been writing about that. And then the, the publicist recently recommended writing a piece about music since the main character is so interested. And she had some ideas of different music venues to pitch it to. Um, so like, I'm definitely mostly a fiction writer, but it's been a lot of fun. I'd say like the last four or five months of own almost exclusively been writing nonfiction related to this novel and yeah it's been a blast that's great so any words of advice or let's maybe we just close this by any word of advice for any writer with an 
book coming out? I have I have my parting words I always like to give people, which is, um, you know, this is, as a debut author, this is not a time to be shy about asking for favors from the people in your life. You know, I think people, you feel reluctant to ask friends and family to come to your events or post about your book on socials or review it on Amazon. But, you know, I think by and large, this is the time that you need to be asking for all those favors. Um, and I think in general, people are really happy to do those kind of things for you, um, you know, or even more tangential connections. Your, your journalism professor might be a great person to blurb the book but you feel weird asking. And so the second point, piece of advice I always give is your team is always there to do that for you. We, This is our job. We have no problem asking for things and being pushy about it if we need to be. Uh, and so we're always able to be kind of a shield for our, our debuts and help them. But, you know, it's it's such an exciting time. I think everybody loves loves a debut writer, feels very excited and happy for them to be starting out in the world and wants to come out and support you. So, um, you know, your teams internally and as well as all of your connections and family. That's a great piece of advice. Well, my only advice is, I, I, I always tell an author, I'm here for you. If you have any question, no question is too dumb. Especially someone who's a debut writer and they go, how is this done? And I go, let us explain it. Let us take care of it. Don't, don't, don't assume anything. Just let us deal with it. So that's, that's, that's always my advice. So it sounds like you've gotten that sort of advice from your team at, at Simon & Schuster. Yes, absolutely. And my advice would just be to remember to thank these wonderful people for all the hard work they're doing. I think sometimes it's easy to, yeah, to think like, oh, this is somebody's job. They're being paid to do this. But, you know, as a teacher, I, I, it's the same. Like, I mean, whatever, whatever you do, it's nice to be thanked. And uh, I'm seeing firsthand how hard these people are working. Um, and I'm really grateful. And I think everyone appreciates just uh, to be reminded, to be reminded of that. Okay. So we're going to close on one question for you, Nick, because you're going to get it a zillion times. Oh, what, God. Are work, what are you working on next? I'm working on another novel. There you go. The See, next... okay. That's, that's the best thing we could hear because yeah. you didn't get burned out on the first one. Good. No, Good. no, no, no. I mean, right. Yeah. I'm trying to balance right now between writing like, yeah, nonfiction pieces about the book um, and then also working on my next one. But like Laura was saying too, it's such an exciting time. It's like every, every week is something new. Um, yeah. It's been awesome. Great. Well, thank you both for being part of this. And it was great. Thank you, everyone. It was great. And it's always helpful to hear everyone's perspective on this topic. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for guiding us through this conversation. And Laura and Nick for giving us a peek into the familiar yet modern ways marketing continues to shift. And Nick, I can't wait to read The Great Transition. The ARC is currently at the top of my massive to read pile at home, but it is there. I'm so excited to dive into it. For the audience, if you find yourself interested in our organization and would like to learn more about the things we do, please feel free to venture to our website at newyorkbookforum.org. Our next event will be in person at Hachette Book Group in New York City, taking place on May 24th with Jane Friedman and Victoria Wilson. We'll be delving into writing, editing, publishing, and breaking expectations with our two brilliant speakers, and we hope to see you there. Have a wonderful evening.